As you can see, um, I, I did one thing over, uh, overnight, or basically two things overnight, to do a little bit of expectation management. All of you are probably smarter than myself, so I'm not going to tell you how exactly uh, you're going to make money with augmented reality uh, and virtual reality. Um, I, I do look into the different business models, though, um, and also look after um, what can be done earlier stages mid or and longer term stages. The, sec uh, the second thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on augmented reality. That's for two reasons, and I've basically changed my presentation overnight. First is, we uh, did talk a lot about virtual reality yesterday, um, and I think there's a huge, uh, a huge potential to talk about it here, uh, to talk about augmented reality here. And I'm going to focus on, on enterprise um, technologies and enterprise software a little bit, because we've had it in the talks uh, this morning with Robert Scoble and Professor Steinecke. They've all been talking about killer applications for VR in games and, and education and everything, but I think there's a huge potential for the technologies to take off in the enterprise market. So that's the two things I'm going to focus on uh, in my talk. Uh, just a quick intro, my name is Wolfgang Sterzler. I'm uh, the CEO of a company in Munich called Reflect, and we're focusing on user-oriented software solutions. We had a lot of these um, hints this morning um, about the, the actual augmented reality market. It hits 1.1 billion investments. Um, Startup Magic Leap closes almost $800 uh, million dollars, um, last year. Um, Apple acquires a company called Metayu, probably all of you know it. Um, they did augmented reality software, augmented reality algorithms. Blipper, another augmented reality company, raised uh, 45, uh, uh, 54 million. Um, Bosch became shareholder of, of ourself. Um, PTC bought a platform called Vuforia, um, which, which does augmented reality tracking as well. The augmented reality and virtual reality market is something we've talked a lot in the conference already. And last week, Tim Cook says, augmented reality will be bigger than virtual reality, and probably all of us know, uh, know that this is going to be the case um, in the future. So just to give you a quick overview of what's actually happening um, in the augmented reality investment market, um, you can see it on this slide, the investments are significantly um, going up, um, and a couple of the highlights in Q2 2016 was Meta, uh, Lumus, a lot, of, a lot of things around um, augmented reality glasses, actually also virtual reality glasses, of course. Um, I want to show that slide because uh, I'm German and we're a German-based company. I'm a little bit scared of the fact that most of the money is, in, uh, is invested in the US uh, American market and in, in the Asian markets. I wish because aug uh, augmented reality is kind of, um, or Germany is a, is, a, is, a, is a country where augmented reality has been a pretty strong technology um, in, in the past uh, 10 or and 20 years with uh, Fraunhofer, with Technik University Munich, um, with Metayo, all these companies, and I wish that Germany doesn't lose, um, doesn't lose that and invests a little bit more money into the technologies because we all know they have huge potential. So I'm asking myself the question, why the hell are, are investors putting so much money into that? And many of you know that video. Um, can we get sound, please? And I still show it because I just love it. <laughs> I think that's, that's not the only case. Um, there is, as I said before, a huge potential for making money in the augmented and virtual reality area. And you don't need to read that slide. Of course, that PowerPoint slide is not something uh, I, sh I should actually show uh, in such a presentation. But I want to take it um, as, as a basis for guiding through a couple of business models. So first of all, there's the opportunity or the, the, the possibility to work as a studio, um, do augmented and uh, virtual reality projects, um, and mainly for enterprise customers. Um, the advantage is that the, the entry barrier is quite low, um, and you, uh, there's really many, many ways, and we've had a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of projects shown on the conference already, to create revenue with augmented and virtual reality. The downside of it is that it doesn't scale very good, and of, of course that's something investors don't like to hear. Um, and there's also low, uh, like, uh, not, not many opportunities to protect IP. But why I like 
doing projects, and we did it a lot as well and reflect as well over the last couple of years, it's because within projects you're gathering experiences. So you, you, make, uh, you, you work out with a customer what brings actually value to the use case and to the company and what not. And based on the experience, you can then create products, which I'm going to come to later on. So the studio aspect is something um, which, which should really not be forgotten um, in the next couple of months and years, especially when the technologies are kind of uh, still searching for, for the killer applications and everything. Of course, there's the, the entire hardware um, market and the entire hardware area. And there's a huge potential, and you can see in all those graphs that the uh, investments in the hardware area is, are the most significant, actually. And of course, th there's a simple reason to it, because it is a large potential uh, scale in the hardware, and you can protect IP. Um, you can patent the, the, the hardware applications, um, and if, if you make it to really sell it into industries, into the mass market, then you can make a lot of money with it. The downside is it's very, very capital intensive. There's a reason why um, companies like Meta raised 54 million, why Magic Leap raised almost 800 million um, in the last year. It costs a lot of money. And please, if, if you consider doing something like that, don't make the mistake and say, I can do that with one or two million. Um, a, a lot of companies tried that already and, and they failed. Um, there's, there's a lot of things going on um, in the hardware market, um, and I just want to give you a couple of ideas. Of course, in the augmented reality area with Meta um, and with CastAR, who are doing uh, some very good augmented reality glasses, VRVANA is trying to find, find, the, find a niche. Um, the HTC Vive, of course, many people know. Um, that's the entire uh, VR range, not the entire VR range, but probably the most, uh, most important, at least for this year, um, ending up with a PlayStation VR. And of course, everyone's kind of looking to the, let's say, mixed reality device um, uh, for, for Microsoft. There's also another um, part of the hardware business, not only the augmented reality glasses, it's input devices, it's gesture devices, which we need in the future. It's devices where we capture data with. Um, and a couple of examples are shown on that slide, uh, like the, the virtual reality rigs, which are necessary to capture virtual reality uh, content. Um, the, the, the gesture um, controls in virtual reality that, so that you're actually able to walk around and to interact with the virtual scene. Then Robert Scoble showed this morning as well um, what's happening also with the Microsoft HoloLens on the left-hand side. That's, that's the Matterport um, device, which actually scans the room in 3D very, very quickly um, and in, in a quality which is really acceptable already. So you can create um, your own room, you can create your fabric hall, um, show, it to the, uh, show it to people, show it to customers. Same goes for Microsoft Kinect. Everyone who's tried Microsoft HoloLens already um, and whoever didn't do that should really try it. I think we have one here on the conference. Microsoft, Kinect, uh, Microsoft with the HoloLens has, is very advanced in the tracking technology. And that's due to the fact that they invested a lot of time and money in the past in their technologies with Kinect and stuff like that. So they have a lot of experiences and they now can port it to the augmented reality device like the HoloLens. Also, you might have seen it outside, uh, probably you passed by. There's other stuff you can, uh, you can earn money with. Um, a little bit more complex here, of course, but in the entire sports area, there's a lot of potential to earn money with as well. Um, and I quite like um, that equipment uh, here. I've tried it on my own in the past. I d don't show you my own video because that's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> But there's quite cool, cool stuff coming up. And the reason why investors are investing so much money into that market is very simple. And I just make, it, um, I just make one example out of it. Last week, there has been a press release um, from ThyssenKrupp. And ThyssenKrupp actually wants to buy 24,000 um, HoloLenses from Microsoft. Now, a HoloLens costs roughly $3,000 at the moment. Let's assume it's dropping down to whatever, I don't know, $1,000 um, in the future. Then it's a very simple calculation. So if one single customer on the planet, Tosin Krupp, buys 24,000 HoloLenses for equipping their technicians, 
then the, the revenue from Microsoft is $24 million. Um, so there is a very, very huge potential for the hardware um, to, to make money with. And as Mark Zuckerberg said, and I think we had it this morning as well, and I want to read that, is over the next 10 years, the form factor is just going to keep getting smaller and smaller. And eventually, we're going to have what looks like normal-looking glasses that can do both virtual and augmented reality. As a matter of fact, when we get to this world, a lot of things that we think about as physical objects today, like a TV for displaying an image, will actually be just a $1 app in the App Store. So as Robert Scoble said this morning as well, that's going to change a lot, and industries are going to flip over completely. Although that's not the area where we as a company earn money in, certainly, um, which is why I focus, uh, which is why I come to, uh, want to come to the point middleware and aggregation. Because there is the need for software technologies to actually produce content for these kind of devices. Um, and a lot of enterprise customers out there, the automotive industry, the machinery industry, the energy sector, they have like huge amount of data. They have uh, data from machines, they, they have CAD data, they have data from technical documentation. And there must be some middleware to actually pull that data together um, to make it kind of publishable, let's say, like that, or to make it available on the glasses, on the devices in the future. Um, that is a very scalable market or a very scalable uh, business model, which is why it's attractive, and there is the potential to save some IP at least. The cons is there is a lot of research and development uh, risk, and it's difficult to predict the needs of the content creators. Why I come back to the first point, studio. Um, for us, it was important in the past to do these projects with enterprise customers to actually figure out what the customers need. Um, and just a very simple um, product which came out of that is actually a platform which we are, um, or which we've implemented for uh, putting 360 degrees videos and photos together. We talked to a lot of customers, Porsche, E.ON, Süddeutsche Zeitung, who's going to be presenting in a panel today. And they all, not all, but some of them said, I don't want to publish my content on Facebook and on YouTube. I don't want to get, get them all the revenue. I want to make my own thing. I want to have my own branded application. I want to, I want to, I want to control the content. I want to create, control the revenue. And then they said, I want to have interactivity. I don't want to have the single, um, the, the storylines, which I can currently do on, on, on YouTube and, and Facebook. And that's why we said we need a platform which can actually do that, make content interactive. So there are no programming skills necessary, and um, the whole platform is just drag and drop to create your own interactive solutions. look at this graph. I think it has been shown on the conference once, at least. Um, it's a forecast from, um, from DigiCapital as well. And there you can see the, the AR hardware thing, which I've talked a lot about. Uh, but there you can also see the prediction for enterprise augmented reality in 2020. And if you take the entire circle with $90 billion and you, you kind of estimate what the enterprise augmented reality piece in it is, then you come to a, around $6 billion. My assumption is that's, that's way too conservative in 2020. And I'll tell you why. We do work a lot in the automotive industry. Our partner is Bosch. Um, and there's the automotive after sales market. Just the automotive after sales market. That's just one single industry between hundreds and thousands. And the automotive after sales market is a market in a size, I don't have a laser pointer, unfortunately, I think, 
with $800 billion in 2015. And if we now say augmented reality or virtual reality can reduce costs in a very small percentage in that market and the companies can create revenue with, with such technologies, then I think $6 billion um, in five years is way too small. I want to show a couple of applications which show the potential for augmented reality um, in, in a couple of slides. Because that's actually what enterprise or what, what companies want to do. On the one side, they want to decrease costs when they talk about production, when they talk about assembly. And on the other side, or after sales, on the other side, uh, on the other side they want to increase their revenue. So how do companies do that? In augmented reality, um, we did work for, or we do work for a company called Liveall Vacuum, um, the pumps which are actually being used in the Hyperloop, and we've created an augmented reality service application. Um, and we put that, or we give that, we gave that to, to technicians which have never done that repair um, on that machine. We did that with 10 technicians, and all of the technicians said the same thing they can now do the repair, like they could do it within half an hour. They just use the application on the tablet. Um, yes, a tablet, you cannot work hands-free, but we had a stand where you, could, where you could freeze the screen, actually. They put it away. It's, a, it's still a little bit shaky, of course, the, the AR glasses improve that, but the technician could do it without actually being trained on the scenario. Um, the, the, the challenge with it um, is that you can do that for every single use case in one language um, and, and for one machine, the challenge is now really, besides all the hardware, to make it scalable. To make it scalable to produce content which the technicians can actually use. And that's where I come back to the middleware section. So there needs to be platforms for industry customers which, which can actually aggregate or, or put, put all the content together and make it usable. And everyone who's done augmented reality projects in the industry already knows that there's a big challenge with, um, with CAD data because it's very complex and we still have the tablets, the phones, they have limited performance, so we need to think about a way how we can actually reduce that. So there's big challenges on the software side. Bosch has actually done a survey with technicians and over 50 participants uh, part, um, were, uh, have been asked about a couple of fa factors um, in AR systems for uh, training and also for the after sales, so for service and repair. And the, the outcome of the survey was that all of them, or, or the average said, there's an increase of 55% um, in, in terms of um, traditional or in terms of quality and time compared to traditional methods of working. Of course, because we don't have like big industry rollouts already, we need to prove that this is really the case, the 52% or 40% or whatever. But even if it's like just 10% increase in efficiency in the after sales market, compared to, to the actual work which is being done there and the costs which are wasted, it's huge. There's one technician um, who actually wrote that on the form. It says, I'm not sure if you can read it, wiring harness and connector locations are very difficult to find without the use of a manual. This system would save hours of lost time. So everyone who is in the, in the automotive industry uh, knows that it's getting more and more complex. The cars are connected. There's cables. There's connectors. And sometimes it's as easy as a connector is just not being connected. That's why the car fails in production and also afterwards. So searching for such issue, issues, augmented reality can help a lot. All the machine manuals in the future could be, uh, could be really improved, searching for components. Um, also, Robert Scoble talked about IoT a little bit, um, like consuming the life data from the machines and making them visible where they are actually needed. That's something augmented reality can do. Some of you know maybe the Audi um, e codes Info application. It's, it's an application um, which, which makes it possible to scan icons in the car, to explore the car, 
um, to, to be ac actually able to have the technical information quickly accessible. Audi has done a presentation on a, on a conference last week talking about this, um, uh, this software, actually. They've talked about all the pros and cons and all the experiences and the, and, and the way wh where they want to go to. Um, and there's things to improve, of course, um, but that's the way to go in the future, that we really make the information um, visible surrounding us. A huge potential, most of you have probably seen that, in the area of teleservices. Um, currently, if a, if a machine error happens somewhere in China, normally you, you, you take the phone, you call some expert, and you try to explain what's happening. And the expert doesn't really understand, so what happens, the expert actually jumps into the plane and uh, flies to, to the machine. The machine is uh, standing still for a couple of days. Uh, the problem cannot be solved. So there's a huge potential um, for the entire area of teleservices also being used in uh, smart glasses a lot. So if companies save 50% of their travel costs in the future, there's a huge business case behind it. Um, and that's technology which we can actually already use. It's not like something we can use in 10 years. I want to show something different, how to increase revenue. You don't necessarily use or, or need to use augmented reality glasses for stuff like that because it's a once, once in a moment situation. You need it for two minutes, for three minutes, for five minutes to convince a customer about an accessory. You don't need to wear it for eight hours. That's stuff you can do already today to upsell um, uh, accessories in, in the automotive industry. Who of who you have seen Marcus Kühne yesterday from Audi? A couple of... That's why I want to show another video, um, what Audi does compared to, to BMW. They do that sort of stuff in virtual reality. And what they've done is they've actually taken the entire web car configurator in virtual reality. <coughs> the potential is huge. 
because what happens is you can not show only one car at the dealer, you can show hundreds of cars, thousands of configurations. I know Audi has, has I think, millions of possible configurations. Um, so you can, uh, you can A, show that, and B, you can potentially reduce the floor space in the future, so it saves you costs as well and doesn't only help you in upsetting the product. I just said, uh, or Kimo just said, I have five minutes to go, so I need to um, accelerate a bit. The last, uh, or one of the last um, areas where you, where you can earn money in is the aggregation of content. That's actually um, stuff like app stores or, or YouTube channels, which are di really distributing content in, in a mass productive way, so to say. It is very highly scalable, um, and you, you can actually control the relationship to your customer. What's the advantage? The disadvantage is it's kind of a bet. Um, so when you bet on the fact that you want to have a, um, a, let's say, art platform for virtual reality, um, then you need to have the masses behind it. You need to have the devices behind it. Um, and if you don't have the devices behind it and you need to wait for the next five years, then you might not be able to, to generate revenue out of, out of, out of advertising. Um, th so that's kind of a bet you need to make, but there is a huge potential actually in that area of content aggregation. And then, of course, there's everything around the integrated um, um, the integrated uh, business models, um, which especially the big corporates are uh, focusing on. It's basically when you have two or more of the above um, mentioned business models, um, you, you kind of create what we already heard a lot, ecosystems. And of course, the big, the big, big players, um, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, they all built their ecosystems, um, not only at the moment, also already in the past, and all of them are working on the technologies augmented in virtual reality. Um, I'm, I, I don't exactly know what's going on at Apple at the moment, but you can only guess the iPhone 7 has now two cameras in there. Uh, Tim Cook said that augmented reality has a bigger potential than virtual reality, so you can only guess that, augmented, uh, that Apple is launching something in augmented reality, which is going to be quite big. Um, so look forward what the ecosystems um, are going to do in the future. And there's certainly, certainly more to come. That's basically my resume um, of, of my speech. Um, I'm not talking about 10 years in the future. I want us, um, especially in Germany, <laughs> to make money with augmented reality, but it's still in its, in, it's in, in its infancy. And the majority of the companies are pre-product and pre-revenue. Um, it's, it's kind of a bet. And we and, and all the companies, they, they pivot and reposition frequently. But that's also a chance, because when other companies kind of pivot and reposition, there will always be a chance to jump into that area over the next couple of months and years. So even if you, even if you don't have the right idea right now, um, you can still jump into the, the area um, in the future. But no matter how you start, I just want to finish with please start because there's a next generation coming up and they understand the technology without having it used at, at least once so that's um, the kid of, of my colleague Dirk he's never worn a virtual reality glass and and you can see like what he's actually doing with it it's amazing he understands it immediately 